Paul, um, Congress now debating different energy proposals, cap and trade, carbon tax, a BTU tax, gasoline tax, um, different mileage standards. There's a whole, as you know, panoply out there. You get to be king for a day in America. Um, which would you advise and why? Which would be the best way forward to drive innovation and also give us the alternative energies we need? Well, we, we thought a lot about that. Um, <clears throat> but to answer your question, cap and trade. Why? We, we think cap and trade is, is really the, the mechanism which gets the market forces mobilized. We've already seen that. One of the businesses we've gotten into in the alternative energy field is uh, producing greenhouse gas credits. And it's a, it's a global cap and trade system essentially that, uh, for example, we are, just a couple weeks ago, I was in Malaysia where we're uh, working with a palm oil manufacturing facility. And what they do is they've got their, their waste sludge that goes into these ponds and it goes through an anaerobic digestion process. And bubbling out from these pits, they look like tar pits, is methane. Hmm. Now methane's 21 times more damaging than carbon dioxide. We, we effectively capture that, that methane, flare it or turn it into electricity, and we basically take that carbon out of the environment. We then get certified by the UN certificates that we can then take to Europe and sell. Um, we're, doing this, we're, we're doing this across, I think, about 11 countries right now. We're doing it in China. I mean, it's interesting. China, we talk about China as being the largest emitter of greenhouse gases or potentially could become the largest. Um, probably half of the emission reductions through offsets could be produced in China. And the nice thing about offsets is offsets... What would be an example? How would you do it? What would what, be an example that you could do in China? Well, the example in China, what we're doing now is <clears throat> working with uh, agricultural, with farms, and basically processing animal waste. Uh, there are other waste streams that you can work with, but animal waste, if you just capture that, you, you collect it, and you, you treat it, you can then capture the methane, mm. um, convert it to 21 parts to one part CO2, take it out of the environment. You can then sell those credits, take those credits and sell them in Europe. So we're doing that in China, we're doing that in India, Brazil, um, and that's having a big impact. We think we'll be at a rate of being able to reduce 40 million tons a year of, mm. of uh, carbon equivalent gases by going through this. So it's, it's a big business. It's got a lot of people around the globe working on it. And one of the things in our industry is people worry about coal-fired power plants, as do all of us. But the way you handle coal-fired power plants is essentially you've got to strip out the CO2 from the emission gases from power plant. Problem with that is you can't do it today. It's not, it's not technically feasible, and economically it probably uh, takes the price of electricity up by, if you could do it, a factor of two to three times. The other thing you can do is you can, you can, you can basically, if you take carbon out of the atmosphere in one part of the world, it basically, it's a, it's a global system, it, it reduces it. So it's a much cheaper way of doing it. It might be, it's a difference between say, 60 to $80 a ton to take out of the air versus say, five to 10. So as opposed to sequestering it and all the costs associated with that, go for a cap and trade. And we think, well we think cap and trade allows sequestration. Mm -hmm. That while sequestration, because we think cap and trade will meet some of the needs, but eventually that price starts to creep up. Right. In the meantime, people are developing sequestration. Sequestration becomes a competing technology. And there are other ways to do it. We think there are other technologies. Our, our group that's focused on climate change is looking at sequestration. We're also looking at mineralization. Can you take carbon and actually turn it into rock? Because sequestration has a number of problems with it too. But we think the best way to do it is to get the market incentivized to go out there, look for opportunities, look for solutions, let those compete with each other, drive the cost down to drive the innovation, uh, and then the best solutions will come up in terms of what's most economical. But we, all, we also think if you keep the cost down, it's going to encourage more people and more countries to get involved because it's not going to be a big hit to the economy. I think if you, you hit um, an economy with a large tax, which in, it's, going to, it's not going to incentivize people to do the right things in many cases, and generally then you're taking the money and giving it to the governments and hoping the governments will find the, most, the best way to allocate right money to get innovation, and typically that's not the way it works. Dr. Chuck, explain to us a little bit, um, what was the method that you discovered in China? There were these other four or five solar companies there. What was your breakthrough? Um, why, why were you able to be successful in the solar business when others weren't? That's my first question. And related to that, 
What is the disruptive technology that could really revolutionize the solar business? What should we be hoping for? Okay, uh, I think um, uh, as as a company, if you want to strike, you know, uh, in a sector, you know, do better than others, company, I think uh, uh, teamwork is very important. Teamwork. So we do have, uh, you know, excellent, uh, you know, international team. Mm -hmm. So. We have people from America, Australia, Malaysia, you know, Indonesia, and Europe, England. So, uh, apart from that, I think uh, this is innovation, mm -hmm. because um, you know, in innovation is the only way, you know, because because for our, in our case, we want to you know uh, increase our business, increase the growth. We need to reduce the cost. That's the only thing you know limiting the growth right. at this moment. Yes. So. Uh, you know, if, if uh, we can do a lot of innovation, so we can reduce the cost. Certainly, I think is, I would say the, the company's ability to uh, say to respond of the change of the you know environment. Right. So I think that's also very important. That's also maybe maybe the sensitivity to to this environment change. For example, in our industry, problem, you know, some people know this is silicon supply. Right has been a huge right. problem yes. for the growth of the industry. So, I mean, like a big companies like, you know, like a BP or these guys, I mean, they're, they're big conglomerate you know, yes. company, but maybe their focus is not here. Right. So, but like us, I mean, we, we, we always say we live on solar. Yes. So that's our only, you know, uh, life. Right. So, so we have been very sensitive, you know, to that and has been deploy all the plan, you know, to address this issue. So that's why so far, although you know most people cannot get silicon for the company to grow, but we didn't mm. have such problem. Mm. You know we have continued grow. Like uh, last year, actually we were already number number four. Mm. You know global, we were number four manufacturer. This year we definitely will be number three. It could be number two. Mm. You know. So Who's in, number one? Sharp. Mm -hmm. So in terms of this, uh, um, you know, manufacturing uh, output. Mm. So yeah, I think uh, it's very important and also like. Uh, uh, this internal management, as I said, the team and uh, execution. Mm -hmm. you, we, we could have great strategy. Yes. Any company will have a great strategy, but if we cannot execute, yeah. I mean, it's not a good strategy. Are you do how much R and D are you doing? Well, we do a lot of R and D, uh, and uh, some people, like analysts, are saying, "Oh, how come you know, uh, Doctor, she only spent two percent of your revenue, you know, on R and D. Other your yes. com company maybe spend five to six percent." I think in ours, I mean, we have to, we have relatively, you know, uh, low cost uh, talent. Yes. So, I mean, as R&D, we only need to buy, you know, so, so much equipment. Mm -hmm. So the most thing is, is, is people need to generate ideas and, uh, and put them into place. And, uh, you know, we do uh, have a leading technology, you mm -hmm. know, in this sector. So we believe uh, silicon is the ultimate answer because that's related to your second question. Right. There are so many... Uh, you know, more innovative way, like especially thin film, you know, try to reduce the cost of silicon. I think yes. uh, that's all look very, uh, very exciting. Mm -hmm. But I think most importantly is uh, uh, we call cost per watt mm. at the installation level. Interesting. Like thin film, you know, we don't, some thin film even, you know, does not use silicon. Mm. They use some other material. But we believe silicon actually is the best choice of material. It's mm. the second most abundant material on Earth's crust. You know, talk, uh, no, no toxic free, right. and uh, especially we can borrow a lot of technology, mature technology being developed in microelectronic industry. Mm. You know, which also use silicon. Mm. So, and of course, I mean, uh, I, we believe for silicon for crystalline wafer, silicon wafer based technology, this cost will also come down. Mm. And uh, for other thin film, you know, unless efficiency can be above thirteen percent, you know, energy conversion efficient above that, otherwise. Mm you know, we believe is probably not going to be competitive. Mm. Yeah. Can I, can I follow up? Please. Um, you know, I think what Dr. Shu is talking about is, is extremely important because if you look at 100 years and you look at the, the total energy demand of the world, today we're at 14 terawatt hours. Um, in 2100, we're going to be about 33 terawatt hours. Add another 33 terawatt hours. And if you want to do that carbon free and you look at renewables, what can possibly be done if you consider all the places where you can add windmills, you look at all the geothermal wells you can drill, uh, take all the biomass facilities using all of the arable land available, 
use all the wave energy, even though it's not technically feasible, but if it were, um, how could you take all that renewable energy, that gives you 15 terawatt hours of the 33 needed, so maybe half. And it's also not realistic you could even get there. Okay, so that's 15 terawatt hours. The potential for solar is 600 terawatt hours. So if you look at where the, the, the potential opportunity is, it's in his business line, which is why your stock's doing so well, I think. <laughs> um, but that's, that really is the answer. It's got to be in solar long term, looking out, say, 50 to 100 years. We can use up wind and, and all these other ones. They're going to be nice additions, right. but they won't even begin to meet the need if we want to maintain uh, the carbon neutrality at, say, 550 ppm, which is where most researchers think we have to end up.